Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, wherever you're watching from. My name is Matt Pierce. I am the Learning and Video Ambassador for TechSmith, and we are here with another great episode of the Visual Lounge, hoping that you're all doing very well on this day. We're going to be talking about course creation and the, some of the secrets that you need to know. If you haven't created a course before and you're thinking like, well, I don't, I'm not a course creator, there's lots of reasons you might want to become one for whether it's your own personal use or for your own organizational use as well, because courses are very popular and a great way to communicate and reach out and help those that you're working with, whether you're doing instructional design training, you're doing documentation, whatever your job role is, I can tell you there's probably a place to create a course. So we're gonna get things going here because we got a great guest today, uh, Emily Weiss from Thinkific's here with us, and I want to just take a second to introduce her because then we'll we'll talk about TechSmith Academy stuff later. But um, as we get going here, let me uh, let me find out where in the world am I at? All right, here we go. So <laughs> Emily is the head of partner marketing for Thinkific, the leading platform to create mar create market and sell online courses. She specializes in building and nurturing strong partnerships rooted in shared values, creative campaigns, and mutual wins. Emily has helped hundreds of course creators along their journey, and she believes that by sharing your knowledge through online education, you can create a genuine impact for your audience while building a thriving business you're proud of. And with that, I'd like to welcome Emily to the Visual Lounge. Hi, Emily. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Super excited to be here today. I was laughing. So That's a fun old picture of me. <laughs> we're, we're, well, that's what they sent me and we're glad you're here and we're, we're glad that you're able to, to uh, talk with us a little bit. Uh, I'm guessing there's people out there that will watch this or listen to this and they may have not heard of Thinkific and they may not have heard of you. So give us a quick rundown and introduce yourself. Sure, absolutely. Well, for those of you who haven't heard of Thinkific, Thinkific is an online course platform where you can create, market, and sell online courses and membership sites. So I think we have over 60,000 course creators on our platform now, uh, in earning incredible amounts of revenue and just driving such an impact in today's world. Uh, my role and how I fit into that picture, I am the head of partnerships over at Thinkific, which means I've been able to work with some of the top course creators in the industry and really see behind the scenes of their business and what's working really well, what they've tried before that didn't work, that might be kind of not known. Uh, and really, I'm excited to be here today and share some of what I've learned over the past few years of working with these course creators. Yeah, that's awesome. And 60,000 course creators, that's a ton. That's a ton of people making content and trying to deliver value to people. Yeah, it's a few. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. So I, I, I'm curious, um, and we're going to get this one, a, a big question out of the way, and then we're going to dive into these these secrets, if you will, because I, I, and I love them because I think they're things that um, are very practical and I think people are going to get a lot of value out of. So Let's let's start with this big question. What what's one of the trends that you're seeing right now with um, you know that's really impacting course creation? Because it seems like you know if you would have gone back five or six years ago, we didn't see the platforms. You know, a lot of platforms, including Thinkific, have popped up. Uh, you know, we didn't see people making courses and using that as kind of an online delivery mechanism for information. So I'm guessing there's things that in 2000, given all the circumstances of this year, that things have uh, maybe become a little bit more impactful or is there, is there something that you've seen that's really made a difference this year for course creators? Mm -hmm. I think there's a few, and actually there's some of our secrets. Because, sure, because sure. We can save those. But <laughs> one thing that I think has been so big this year and will continue to be, and has already, was already kind of ramping up, but in 2020 really accelerated was the need for some sort of community element in your learning environment. So whether that's like a group or in Thinkific, we have our communities feature or it's live lessons and sessions like this where people can connect with you. I'm seeing more than ever before people craving that sense of connection and not just with the course creator, but with the their peers. So anyone else in that course. And so the course creators who are doing really, really well right now are finding some way to incorporate community into their learning experience. I'd say yeah, that's I, probably one of the bigger ones right now. Well, that makes so much sense. I think that community, I, I mean, how, how many of us have been locked in our homes for almost a year now and uh, not getting that, that same kind of connection. And I can, I, I can imagine, and, and I see this on our side too, through both our, our podcasts and as well as other things that we do that, yeah, people want to feel 
connected with whoever the creators are. I mean, I think you even look at platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn, right? I'm, I'm guessing their growth is continuing to go because we're craving it. We just want to be connected. And what a great, what a great thing to, to understand if you're going to create a course. Um, now, Emily, one thing you mentioned that uh, I'm curious about, like a lot of people are doing this independently, right? Or they're, they're small businesses that are making courses. Um, do you see a lot of corporations and companies starting to use platforms like Thinkific for course creation as well? Yeah, absolutely. So actually in the last, how long has it been now? A year and a half, I would say <laughs> like last year and a half, Thinkific has launched what we call Thinkific Plus. And that's our option for kind of more the mid market or the larger companies who are looking to provide customer education at scale. And so we see a lot of organizations turning to a platform like Thinkific to help educate their customers um, and to really provide like an an in-depth learning experience that will help their customer better understand how to use their own product and create a more sticky experience. But we're also seeing companies use Thinkific for uh, employee education and for internal training. Um, and then we're also seeing them use it as the same way SMBs or, or entrepreneurs are using as in their marketing materials and, and delivering value early in their marketing funnel. Yeah, well, I know we're big believers in that that philosophy that you know help help out your customers, help out people who aren't your customers, and you're going to see the the benefits come back from that. So, so thank you for sharing that. Well, I want to I want to dive into our our uh, secrets right now, but before we do that, I just want to mention for anyone that's is watching the live portion of this, uh, if you got a question, you got things that you want to ask Emily about, please put those in the chat. We are watching that and we'll get to those here as we can. Uh, so let's, let's do this. Let's go to our first secret. Do you want me to reveal it on screen or do you want to say it first? <laughs> no, you can reveal it. <laughs> All right. So let's, here we go. Number, number one, sell before yeah. you create. <laughs> This is my favorite secret. That's why I was super excited about this one. Because <laughs> I think if if you're watching this and if you take one thing away from this today's session, I hope it's this point that we always say don't rely on your hunches when you're creating a new product. Like take the time to prove market demand. And a really great way you can do that with online courses is selling before you create or looking at that pre-sale methodology. Now this is important for so many reasons, but I think the first reason is like you don't want to create something and put all of this time and energy and upfront uh, resources into building something that you haven't proven the market is interested in because then you'll be in that situation where you like are all excited. It's launch day. You're pushing something out. It's a big reveal and it's just like crickets right? Like you don't want to be in that situation. You want to have done the work beforehand, been talking to your audience all along, understanding kind of what problems they have and how you can solve them so that when you launch this, it's such an easy yes for your audience because you've already talked to them and you know exactly what they need. I love to share the story here of Dory Clark. So Dory's on Thinkific. She's been with us for a while. She's a really successful author of business books and she does this she did this pre-sale idea so effectively when she was launching her most recent online course. So she did the same, she did exactly what I'm telling you to do. So she went and surveyed her audience. So she just said like, hey, I'm thinking of creating a course. What is your single biggest professional challenge? And she looked at all the answers and she saw kind of like one overwhelming theme coming in. She said, okay, that's where I'm going to focus for my online course. So she went, built kind of like her one page overview of her course, put kind of like what she thought her learning outcomes would be in there and then set a pre-sale price. So it was, it was lower. Like her course now I think sells for over $2,000, but in wow. this case she was charging only $500, which like also courses can be a really premium product for anybody listening. That's like, nah, I'm going to create a $19 course. Like you can pack in a lot of value into an online course and really deliver transformations. But so Dory did that. She took her, uh, one pager and basically anybody who responded and said that that was their biggest challenge. She said, Hey, I'm going to create this course. Would you buy that for $500? And some people were like, yeah, we'd buy that for $500. And so people actually told her like, 
yes, we will pay money to learn that from you. And it wasn't a crazy amount of people. I think she had like a total of 15 people tell her that she did buy that. But that was enough to prove market demand. Like you don't need thousands and thousands of people like begging you for your course, but you do need a few, like at least like five or 10 people that would be interested in purchasing your course. I think that's kind of the starting point is to talk to your audience and make sure that they're actually interested in what you're about to create. Well, I think that's, I think that's great advice and it can play in so many different ways, right? Like you're doing your analysis, you're understanding your audience, you're understanding the needs. So you're going to make the right thing. Uh, it's so easy to go out and make something. And then, then, you know, I think uh, the, uh, the saying is if you build it, they will come, which probably isn't true, right? Like you need to know that you've got a, a bunch of baseball fans to know that they're going to, if you build it, they'll come. So great, great advice. Um, uh, you know, I guess one of the questions, you know, you said surveys are, is probably a big part of that. You know, you got to, probably helps if you know you have an audience or you got to build an audience first. Um, are there other kind of tools that have help you've seen help people to do this understanding kind of what they need to do before we, we move on to our next secret? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of different things, like Absolutely, you should think about building your and growing your audience. So if you don't have an audience yet, that's okay. But start thinking about how you're going to grow that audience of people who will purchase your online course or your product or whatever. So if you're an entrepreneur, you're probably already thinking about that. If you're in the early stages now, you can also go look in communities or forums or places where your ideal audience is already hanging out and go see what those conversations are or what questions they're asking or the problems that they're having. And you can start to see, can I solve that for them? You now with tools too, like Instagram or Facebook, where you have this ability to do live video, you can also have that live interaction with your audience and start asking questions, uh, whether it's through polls or through the chat and just kind of have these organic conversations with your audience at scale, which is super helpful. Um, and then you can also go do some competitor research. I think a lot of the times people get scared when they see that there's somebody else in their space doing what they're doing. And so they panic a little bit and they're like, ah, there's already somebody teaching cooking classes. I can't do that too. But if there's a competitor out there who's already succeeding in your space, it's actually a really good sign of market validation because that means that there's a whole audience out there that are looking to learn that thing. And there's something about you that will make uh, your offering a little bit differentiated and you can start to capture your own market size, if that makes sense. No, it makes, it makes perfect sense. So you got to leverage kind of all the different places that you have. And I would say for companies, you know, look to your newsletters, look to your, you know, your email campaign list as a, if you have permission to email those folks and that those are all really, really awesome pieces of advice. Thank you. Well, let's, let's jump to our next one because, you know, I think these secrets are pretty awesome. So we're going to give me a second here to switch to the next one. The next one is repurpose first. Now this one's interesting because you know, I think I read through all these beforehand and I said, oh, I get that one. This is the one I'm like, I think I know what it means, but I'm not sure. So Emily, tell us, what does it mean when you say repurpose first? Yeah. So this is actually also part of the pre-selling piece. So one of the ways that you can decide like what content you should turn into an online course is like, look at your best performing content. So whether you're an entrepreneur or a company, if you have a blog post or a YouTube video that is crushing it and so many people are watching it, that's a really good place to start when you're starting to think about what your online learning content could be. Now, the reason why I say repurpose first is because a lot of the times we see entrepreneurs or small businesses cranking out content, like huge volumes of content, whether it's blog posts or video or whatever their content method is, there's a lot of it and there's gold in there. And so I always encourage people when you're thinking about creating your course, once you have your topic, take a look at everything you've already created and think, is there anything in here that can be repurposed into my course? And there's a few different ways that you can repurpose. So you can expand on things. So if you have a blog post or a case study, you can kind of go the next step. So if a blog post is talking about uh, the what, your course can now become the how. You can also reformat content. So maybe you published an ebook last year and it was super high performing. Now you want to kind of uh, update it, add some more information, create a more engaging experience. You can reformat some of your base content in your ebook. Um, you can also start to curate your own existing content. So one of the things um, that I always talk about is people don't necessarily want 
more information. Like we have, we're being inundated with information every day, all day long with social media and the internet and our email newsletters. And there's so much information. So people, when they are taking online courses or enrolling in online experiences, they're looking for transformations. So if you can curate your content, and even if it's already existing, but you can curate it in a way that will take them step by step through whatever problem you're trying to solve for them, that can be really, really impactful. And it doesn't always need to be net new content that you're creating for your course. Um, you can also start to like refocus. So maybe you've done a whole, you've done a whole blog post around SEO and you talked all about SEO and now you want to take, teach an SEO course, you can um, repurpose kind of some of your basic principles through a new lens. So maybe you were talking about SEO for bloggers in your blog post, and now you're going to talk about SEO for uh, small businesses. And so you can now create a course all around that, And but the same principles are applied. And then as your last resort, you can go create new content, but like there's so much out there already. Take a look at what you have and that. I think it starts to make creating an online course or customer education materials or whatever you're building a little less overwhelming when you can pull from what you already have. I, I love that advice. And I know, uh, you know, again, just having seen uh, folks do that successfully and, and you, you, you've said it a couple times a word. I want to make sure we define this a little bit for our audience in this, because I think it's important is you keep talking about the transformational experience, right? And I, I'm just curious by the, when you say that, what you mean, because I, I, I think I know, again, I think I know what it means, but I want to be sure when you're thinking about it, what, what do you mean, Emily? Yeah. So I guess I want everybody in the audience to think about like the last online course you bought or the last book you bought even or training or whatever it was. And think about like why you bought that, right? And people always think like, oh, I was bored or like, oh, I was curious. But your true customers, when they're buying something from you, like an, ed an information product, it's because they want to go from their desired state. So where they are right now to their, or sorry, the current state <laughs> where mm -hmm. they are right now to their desired state. And so they're looking for the path of least resistance to get there. And your course can be that. So for example, if you have a, uh, a new graduate and they are like fresh out of university and they have no idea what to do, but their desired state is they're rocking their dream job. They're, they're living the dream. They've landed their dream job, but there's ambiguity and there's questions like I don't know how to get there and I can go on Google but there's going to be a million different blog posts and things and I don't know and so if you can create uh, the path of least resistance from where they are right now to where they want to be that's the transformation you're trying to create and so we talk a lot about this at Thinkific is like how do you create impactful student transformations because if you can do that whether it's a student getting their job or um a person with chronic uh, pain uh, learning how to properly stretch and have mobility, or it's somebody who wants to learn how to dance and now they can dance confidently or whatever those transformations are, that's when your students will be happy. That's when they'll start referring clients for you. That's when they'll re repurchase when you have your next online course launch. If you're a company using this for customer education, they'll be so sticky because they feel this sense of customer loyalty because you've empowered them to achieve their goals or whatever they were out there trying to achieve. So a good example of this from the company lens is Hootsuite uh, uses Thinkific to deliver customer education at scale. And they do uh, like social media training and they teach people like, like for a lot of people, they might not like know the basics about platforms or they might not know how to use Hootsuite. So they have different levels of transformations that they're creating for their students. Yeah, I love that. And I, I, cause I love that it focuses rather than I'm just going to give you information. It focuses about the experience. It focuses on helping someone do something different, do something better, do something more impactful, whatever it might be. So thank you. I, I think that's really good to keep in mind. And I think from my perspective as an instructional designer, even as corporations, right, you think about the onboarding experience or the, even the HR trainings that we all have to do that we're all looking at like, Ugh, I don't want to do these courses. You know, can we make it more transformational and, and provide something of greater value than just, 
I check the box at the end. And I know sometimes there's things like that, but uh, so really great answers. I do want to ask one of the questions that, that came into the chat, if you don't mind. Um, Grant says, I build for clients one specific need. Uh, how can I pivot this for a general market? And I would add to this, to Grant's question, does he need to? Uh, so, sorry, just so I understand, uh, yeah. thanks for your question, Grant, <laughs> but so, so he's building a, like a digital product for his specific audience. And now he's yeah. wondering how he can expand his scope. Yeah. It sounds like it's, and I don't have all the details and Grant can, you can always clarify in the chat, but it sounds like it's very specific, like very targeted content. Um, and he wants to kind of go a little bit broader, probably to make it so he can maybe sell that broader. And I was, I'm adding to that question of like, does he need to? Yeah, I'm right there with you, Matt. Like I, I'm a big fan of a niche audience and like knowing exactly who you're trying to talk to and what problems you're solving for that audience. Because you know, the old saying, like when you try to help everybody, you're going to help nobody because you're, you've now diluted your secret sauce to the point where it's not as impactful. And so I think knowing who your audience is, knowing exactly who you're talking to can be super powerful in growing and building a business. And it's just a matter of continuing to tap into that market. Now, if it's so niche, we can go to that example that I had brought up before around refocusing your content. So if you're currently teaching something that's applicable for different groups, you can, but you might want to think about how that will change your business and your branding and the impact that that will have overall in your messaging, because sometimes it can be really hard. But like an example could be if you're teaching, we'll stick with the SEO example. If you're teaching SEO for bloggers and you're crushing it and now you want to teach SEO for, um, I don't know, animal trainers, <laughs> then you can start to like, you can have both courses kind of side by side and you can start having people self-select, but the overall bucket is that you're the SEO expert. And so the theme can be applied to different audiences, but then that's going to be like two different sales pages, two different messages. It's just, it's just going to create a bigger, um, scope for you to consider. Yeah. And, and Grant does... <laughs> uh, Grant clarifies, he says he has a client commissioned him for topics for an industry and wants to broaden the topics. And it's a very niche industry and insurance industry. And I, you know, I think, I think you're right. Just, you know, either stick in that niche and say, I'm going to be the expert and then you can premium charge for it, I would imagine. Or you yes. can find those other topics that are going to allow you to broaden out, but maybe you've got expertise in that, that area, you know, uh, and that's, that's value, really valuable if you can become the expert in that area. So uh, thanks for answering Grant's questions. I want to get on to, to secret number three, because I think it's my favorite one. Uh, so let's go here. We're switching here. You can see there's number two. And now we're going to reveal number three, 10x value with video. How could how could I, from TechSmith, not be excited about this one? <laughs> I was going to say shocking that this is your favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I mean... I mean, we we always talk about the value of video uh, uh, from a TechSmith perspective. I'm really I'm really curious what you're seeing, Emily, with the core, all these creators that you're working with, at uh, you know through Thinkific. I'm I'm curious why is it that you're you think this is it's 10x or you know more give or give or take a few. I'm sure. Yeah. So, I think. Well, there's a reason we're here today together talking about video and online courses, right? They go so hand in hand. I think in a lot of ways, when people are purchasing an online course from a small business, they're really looking to connect with you as the entrepreneur and video is the best way to do that. So I always encourage people to like start your course with a video where you're sitting and you're just even just introducing yourself, being on camera, being yourself, showing your face because people are as we spoke about at the very beginning of this discussion, craving connection, whether that's through the community, whether that's through your instructor, they really want that. And video is so much more impactful versus just written lessons. It's also most people's preferred learning method. So most people have a really hard time just like clicking through text and trying to absorb all of that information. And so if you can deliver content through video, you're much more likely to get your students through that transformation and actually achieving the results that you're hoping to, because it's a much more engaging way to present content. Um, that makes a lot also, of sense. I get, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get a lot of questions. I feel like the next question I can already anticipate is like, well, how long should my videos be? <laughs> and like, what kind of video should I create? And I always say, start your video 
I'm talking specifically through the lens of online courses. So you always want to start with a video that's like a welcome video. That one can be pretty short, like a two minute, three minute video where you're just jumping on face like full screen. Hey, it's Emily from Thinkific. I'm here to teach you how to create great video for your online courses. This is what you're going to learn. I'm so excited. Thank you for joining me. Then your actual course content videos, I would say shorter is better. So I've seen courses where people upload like an hour long video for a lesson and it's easier maybe for filming, but it's really hard to digest for your students. Like think about it. If you're watching an hour long video, you might learn a hundred things, but you might only have one key takeaway. And if you're as a course creator, really trying to create those transformations, you want to kind of get your message across. And sometimes you need shorter videos to do that so that your student can actually absorb that. So I usually say seven ish minutes is the sweet spot. I wouldn't go too much further past seven. Uh, and don't worry about your videos being too short. If you can film a four minute video and it gets the content across and your student is getting what they need from that, that's okay. Longer is not always better here. Can and I can I just add to that, Emily, real quick on the length? Because, I mean, I, we're right there with you on this. TechSmith actually has some data that shows in terms of viewer preferences. Uh, and I'm sure we can put a link in the, the chat for anyone that wants to go out and see that. But we found that uh, there's a lot of people that actually prefer those seven minute videos. And, and here's my hypothesis about it uh, that I, I think it would see if it rings true for you, too, is that. The, the challenge with the 30 second to one minute video is you're, there's really not a lot there. Like right? it's hard to teach someone something of significance in that short amount of time. Um, but seven minutes, that's going to give you enough that you can actually give enough detail in the instruction. But we're with you that if you can do it in four minutes or three minutes or two minutes, please do that. And don't don't drag it on so that it's going to go on for, you know, 30 minutes if it, if it doesn't have to be. I, I do suppose there's probably some topics that qualify in that 30, 30 minute range. You want to make sure you've gotten that one thing that you focused on in depth. Uh, and I'm sure there's some complicated topics out there. Does that, does that ring true for you as well? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, one caveat is like, don't do what I used to do and just talk a lot faster to try to make your videos a little <laughs> bit shorter. <laughs> like <laughs> make sure your videos are like, uh, yeah, shorter, but not necessarily faster. Like you can break your content out into different videos. So if it would have been say a 10 minute video, maybe you want to split it into two fives and then they have like one key takeaway for those two videos. Um, so yeah, <laughs> make sure I you also slow down. I tell viewers yeah. also watch at time and a half speed if they can, you know, like you can get yeah. through this faster. I'll keep going at my pace. You can watch me a lot faster if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really, that's funny. I always seem to watch my videos on like two and or two speed at least. And mm -hmm. then when I like switch out and talk to real people, I'm like, are you talking in slow motion or? <laughs> <laughs> at, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you, you know, you talked about length is one of the challenges I think people have with video uh, as you're seeing people that trying to adopt and bring in video. Cause I do think it's something that's, it's, you know, it's, it's become such a medium that's easier to access in terms of like, everyone can create video now. We've all got studios in our pockets. Um, what are some of the other challenges you think the people new to course creation are having when it comes to, to using video, especially because it's so important as you're saying to really be able to convey your messages. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge that I hear is confidence, to be honest with you. It's like, oh, no, I'm not good at camera. Or like, Emily, it's easy for you to say you can get on camera and talk all day long. But for me, it's terrifying. And I just I think it's the again, like it's just getting on camera and doing it and practicing and showing up. And whether that's a live stream to like your 10 followers on Facebook or it's pre-recording your video beforehand, it's actually doing it, I think is the number one challenge. Then I start to hear a little bit more about production and they're like, oh yeah, no, I can't do video because I don't have a, I can't, I don't have the budget for a videographer. Like that is not a thing when you are first getting started. Like you can definitely be scrappy. People will, will forgive you if your video quality is not perfect, especially right now in 2020 when everyone is having to turn on video for the first time and learn how to do this. People are super patient and willing to forgive if the content is good. So if you're watching this, I'm sure you've already learned a lot about how to create video and things, but like just your webcam, like you said, your phone, we of course creators creating courses from their phone all the time. The one piece of advice I have, and interested to hear your thoughts here too, Matt, is like 
The one thing I don't compromise on when it comes to video is the sound. So, but that said, I just bought this microphone. I'm really proud of it. <laughs> uh, I just bought it. It's a little bit more expensive than before. Um, but for the longest time, I recorded all my trainings, all my webinars, everything using like a $50 blue snowball mic from Amazon. And it worked fine. So don't let yourself get caught up in like, oh, I'm not good at video or like, oh, I don't have the right equipment. Just you start with what you have now and just keep doing it because your first video is never going to be your best video. You're probably going to look at it and be like, oh, that was awful. I still feel like that, but eventually it gets better and you can start creating more impactful videos for your audience, I would say. Yeah. And, and we, yeah, we agree, completely agree with you at TechSmith. The audio is a place not to compromise. In fact, I had a situation, I was, I shot a video and I messed up the audio. I forgot to switch to, I, I all went through my MacBook instead of my microphone and how painful of a mistake that was. Um, but with that said, I, you know, I think cause a lot of people, like you said, they're just terrified of being on camera, hearing their own voice. You know, if you make that kind of mistake, you have two options. You either run with it and do the best you can, or you, you re have to redo it. Um, in my case, it wasn't something I could redo. It was like, not like I couldn't just turn on my camera and be like, let's recreate that whole situation. Cause it was, you know, much more authentic than that in the moment. So yeah, absolutely. I think you've got great advice. And in fact, I think, uh, if I didn't know better, you were reading from my script of, uh, things that I usually talk about, like make your first bad video, get it done. And, you know, interesting enough, some, I saw a comment, someone's like, Oh, telling people to fail fast is not good advice. And what I would say is we're not telling people to fail fast. We're telling people to like, just take that opportunity to learn and get better and better. And you're going to make great content. And I think to your other point, the content has to be good. You got to have something to say. You have to have an opinion. It, you know, it doesn't have to be earth shattering, you know, Albert Einstein level of like new thinking, but you have to have an opinion about this stuff, whatever it is, insurance or video or, or course creation or whatever topic you're talking about, uh, have, a, have some thoughts about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go, oh, go ahead. And then we'll, we'll got a question from Bill coming in here in a second. Nope, I'm ready. I'm rambling okay. anyway, so I'm excited. <laughs> oh, it's, it's all good stuff. Bill asks, is there a place uh, to learn the bait or for the basics? I've got to read the question better here. Is there a place uh, to learn the basics of learning how to design an online course on my own? Currently, I'm using the template software used by the university I work for for my classes. So Emily, if someone wants to learn about course creation, and I'm guessing it's not just the mechanics of how do I put lessons and things like that, but do you have any good resources you like to go to? Uh, yeah, it's thinkific.com. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. No, I'm joking, but we do have some incredible resources there. So one course that I'm thinking of is our customer education team just created this phenomenal fast track course. And that's like the fast track to creating your first online course. So we cover the basics of online course creation, kind of how to use the Thinkific platform, uh, and as well as like best practices and tips and tricks. So you get free, it's free. It's a free course. You get access with the Thinkific account, whether it's a free account or I'll share a trial with everybody today for you to go check it out. And it's a really, really helpful resource. We also have our online education business masterclass. That one covers um, so much information and it's a little bit more on the things we were talking about today, like how to pre-sell your course, how to put together your actual first pre-sale landing page, um, talk about marketing strategies a little bit in that one. So those are just free courses that you get when you sign up for Thinkific, either as a free account, paid account, or a trial. It's open access, so you can go check those out. Also, our blog has some really good like master guides. Like there's this one, I think it's called the ultimate guide to creating online courses. <laughs> uh, and it's phenomenal. Like I sometimes still go back and read it for some gems. So um, those are a few. Uh, if you want some more guidance too, you can always reach out to our team and we can point you in the right direction if there's something specific that you're like curious about. But Go check out our blog. Go check out our customer education site because there's some great things on there. It's like we know how to make an online course or something. <laughs> You've got some experience, I'm sure, and seen a lot of people do it well. And I would just add to that, go watch, go look at other people's courses. Like go steal the best ideas, right? Like don't be ashamed of saying like, oh, you know, they this person did this really well. I want to do that. And then go, you know, it takes a little bit of figuring out how they did it or, you know, to make it your own. But uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of looking at other people's content and, and seeing what I can 
learn from it because other people do stuff really well. And Emily, you asked, you, you brought up the microphone. So we knew people were going to ask, they want to know, uh, what microphone are you using? And I, I'm assuming it's a USB microphone. Yeah. So I actually just went with USB because like I work in tech and I'm still not a techie person. So like the idea of having an audio interface and all these things, I was just like, I'm going to mess up and I'm going to forget to turn it on or put the card in or whatever the situation is. So this is just a sure, uh, I think it's just an SM7. I think it's called. It's like the, the one in between the really, really fancy one that has the whole interface and then kind of some of the other options. So it is a USB mic, but you can also plug it into an interface. So it plays both depending on what your audio setup is like. Um, yeah, that's all I got Perfect. for you because I'm not an audio expert, but it works for me. If I can figure it out, anybody watching can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the nice thing is microphones are, have come just the availability to get good audio is so much easier than it's ever been with USB microphones. Sure, it's got a great line blue, uh, you know, with the Yeti and the Snowball. Those are great ones. Audio Technica. I mean, there's so many great microphones out there and the prices just keep, you know, are so reasonable when you think about the impact that it will have on your on your course creation, I think it's it's such worth it. Well, we've talked a lot about video, so let's move on to our next one here. So moving on to number four, community equals success. And you've mentioned community a little bit more, but tell us a little bit more of what you meant by this one. Yeah, I think this is really what we talked about earlier. Like the what, when we look at our most successful course creators, the underlying theme for all of them is there's some element of community, whether that is their Facebook group that they have, whether they're using Thinkific community feature, whether they're using in-app discussions so that people can comment on their lessons and feel like they're actually engaging with each other. It is like such an important part of an online learning experience right now. And like as human beings, it's that level of accountability, I think, that we need sometimes to get through things. I don't know about you, but like I can sometimes, for example, I enrolled in a pottery class and I'm learning how to do pottery and I'm loving it. But even some days I'm like, oh, I don't really feel like going. Like maybe I want to stay home and watch Netflix instead. But I have a friend that co goes to the pottery classes as well. And so I go every single week without fail because I know she's going to be there and I don't want to let her down. And you can create that same level of accountability in an online experience. So you can have people showing up or you can create accountability partners in your community or really find a way for your audience to feel like engaged and in it there with you and with the other people that are learning. One thing I really like that I'm also seeing with the community piece is we're seeing um, course creators take advantage of our groups functionality and creating cohorts so that they have like a group of students going through the course at the same time. So they'll do like time bound launches and then have like a cohort of a few hundred or a few thousand, depending on where you're at in your business, maybe 10 <laughs> students going through their online course and learning from each other and connecting and they have a private group. And that's been a really great way to create community. Um, one other thing is that this is also a really great way for you to, as an entrepreneur, add recurring revenue because a lot of the times the community piece is so important that people will pay for it. And so we see this when I think, when I think back to like our top online course creators, they have the community and they actually charge up for it. So they have a membership site on Thinkific where people are paying a recurring revenue and time and time and time again, when we ask people, well, why is your audience still paying you? Is it because you're constantly releasing new content? They're like, yeah, but it's really because of the community. And that's how they've been able to really grow this revenue stream is by facilitating such an incredible connection opportunity for their audience. Yeah, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast this last week and they were talking about actually about this kind of idea of community and, and the importance of it for the particular, the particular creator of, and he was making a, a kind of a master class of his own. And he was talking about a kind of leader, some leadership principles. But the thing that I found interesting was he said that the value that people got out of the class, yes, he obviously provided knowledge, but it was the ability to hear those stories to get to know those other people inside of the group and then connect with them in a, in a very, that we'll use that transformational way because it was leading them to have different experiences when they were thinking about, and he was again, teaching leadership principles. So in their leadership principles, right? Like, um, and so I think that it's such an interesting concept here. And I'm, and I'm thinking about like, 
if I can share an experience here as well, that when I was in grad school, I took a job with this little company that had, was a startup and they were doing learning experiences for places like uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, the McDonald's. I mean, they had some big name clients, but what they were basing it on is like they'd come in and they'd say like, well, what are you trying to do? And, and then they use these stories. But throughout those stories of these different characters, you had these points of community and connection. And it's always stuck with me. That's it's, it's such an important thing to do. It seems um, like it's easy to overlook and probably it feels... Emily, and I'm sure you think of it's got great tools, but the, even just with great tools, it's, it feels like it's probably harder to facilitate. Like it takes attention. It takes time to think through what's going to build up a good community. So what have you seen that works well? I mean, obviously you can have a group place for people to chat. They have, you know, you could create uh, kind of touch points where you're asking them questions, but what kind of things have you seen creators do to, to, to foster and facilitate community, uh, whether in Thinkific or outside of it? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like the thing that we see is uh, people showing up. Like, yeah, it's not always like easy and it does take time and resources, but it's it's the creator showing up and being there that I think makes a difference. Then I think the other thing is they're really facilitating audience support and questions. So, and I, we see this in our own Thinkific group. We see this, I was just interviewing John Lee Dumas and Kate Erickson, and they were talking about the same thing that they start to see their community getting involved from a point of like answering the questions themselves so that you as the host or the leader don't have to go in and answer every single question because your community starts to kind of do it for you. And so I think creating those moments, whether it's more formal, like adding some kind of like ambassadors in there. So picking a few people to act that way for you, or just like encouraging their posts and, and connections. The other thing that works really nicely is like when you have your course and you say, okay, this is your homework, go do this thing and then post it into the community. And so that's part of your learning experience. They're not just totally separate, but they're actually integrated. So it's like, if you're teaching a course in your black and white photography and you're saying, okay, go capture a photo of a bicycle and practice your composition and then go post in the group. And then everybody's posting their pictures of bicycles in the group and commenting and supporting each other. And um, it's those type of prompts, I think, that really get the conversation going and creating those opportunities to connect. Um, the other thing is obviously like live video. So show up live in your communities <laughs> is a great way to do that. So doing this and jumping on and creating those moments for them to feel like they're actually connecting through Q and A or bring somebody on as a guest or wherever you're at in your strategy. Yeah. I mean, I love that idea of, of, of showing up, right? Like I, then to me, that's it, whether you're internal or external doing extra training, just being present is such a, has such a value and then building, being able to allow people to build shared experiences, right? Like, I, I think about, you know, you know, we think about other learning opportunities we might have in our life, whether that's, you know, going to school, whether that's, you know, uh, primary education or, or college or whatever it might be. Those shared experiences often go well beyond the learning and, and, ha and have a dramatic impact on that. So I love this idea that, you know, start building up your, your shared experiences and knowledge together because... I often find that that brings out something, you know, like in, in these chats, oftentimes we're doing with people, I learn as much, if not more than our audience is probably learning. Cause I'm like, Oh, Oh, that's such a great idea. And it spurs like, you know, maybe three other ideas out of the conversation that I hadn't been able to have those thoughts just on my own. Cause I'm frankly not that bright about it, but you know, like the things that you're saying, it's like, Oh, okay, well, cool. Now I can think about how I might do that or this. So, uh, mm -hmm. fantastic points. And, uh, you know, we're, we're grateful for all our community out there and thankful for everybody that's tuned in today so far and is watching. Don't forget, if you got questions, drop them into the chat. We're happy to answer those the best that we can. Um, we've got one more secret. We're, we've got about, you know, five or six minutes. So let's move on to that last secret here. And then we've got some other things, you know, we'll, when we wrap up, we got an offer that Thinkific has been so generous to to, to share with us and we'll get to that in just a second. But so there's number four and we go to number five is more interactive, the better. So yeah. tell us, so a, tell is, us a little bit about this. This is going back to kind of what I was saying about chopping up some of your lessons and creating transformations and all those things that we've been talking about, how you could do this and how you can start to reinforce this 
learning is through interactive experiences. And that's when I start to really love a platform like Thinkific because you can easily include things like quizzes or surveys or assignments or action items like go post this in the group now and then come back and keep learning. So it's the basics behind this are get your student to do something. Don't just be a talking head sitting and da 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 and they just click through and they're like, okay, yeah, I learned. <laughs> like, no, they didn't. <laughs> they need to go do something to reinforce that learning, whether it's like submitting it back to you as an assignment and you grade it for them and send it back if you're if you're more of like a coach or a consultant. Maybe it's a quiz to reinforce the learning and they can't move forward until they get a certain score. So they actually have to go pay attention. Or it's a survey where you're getting more like open-ended answers and asking them to kind of like reflect on their experience so that they can start um, reiterating kind of what they're learning. I just think this is so, so important to give your student the chance to go apply what you've taught them. So don't just tell them what to do, give them the opportunity to execute. So like we'll see course creators actually say like, okay, stop right here. Do not continue. Like don't pass go until you've done this thing. Like you don't go watch the next video until you've written out your one page marketing plan or you've gone and put your film in your camera or whatever your action item is. It's really important because that keeps your student engaged, learning and moving forward and actually being able to apply what they've learned. Yeah, th this is fantastic. And I'm trying to remember the name. There's a principle here. There's actually a research principle. Uh, and I am pretty sure it, now I can't even remember the researcher's name, but I'll get it and I'll, I'll post it someplace. Uh, but basically says if in particular, they were looking at studying video and the effects of learning on video. If you ask people to stop, take notes about what they're learning and, you know, just jot down even a few ideas, the impact of them learning those things are actually improved greatly because of that action. And I, and I just love how the simplicity of that, right? Like, you're interactive. You could be as interactive as you want. You can do all these really cool, crazy things, but it could be as simple as like, don't just don't move on. <laughs> just do the thing we're asking you to do. And then video two, video 12, whatever it is, will make more sense and be much more impactful than if you just try to, to rush through all 12 of them. And I, and I see this even with uh, people learning things like Camtasia that oftentimes they want to learn everything they need to know. And then they don't make a video right away. And then they just don't know how to do it because they can't remember because they didn't get the application in. So uh, I, I do wonder, Emily, um, you know, as we think about interactions, we've talked about a few, but anything that you think you would recommend, if, especially maybe let's talk in terms of video. I just mentioned like pausing it or not going to the next one. Any other interactions that you've seen that have been particularly successful or people using lots of video in their courses by chance? Mm -hmm. Um. That's a very on the spot yeah. question, you know, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of like how I can actually add this. Like, are you asking more like as lesson types in video and how it's incorporated more about, the, I'm looking for more of the, like, how do you make sure you're getting those interactions? So if you're, let's say someone's watching this and they're probably watching this because they're interested in video, they're interested in building a course and we've said build out video. And now we said build out interactions how do we bring those two together to make sure that you're we're accomplishing and using both of these secrets to to optimize success for our the people attending our courses? Mm -hmm. Yep, I would say it's simpler than you might be watching. Like if you're watching, it's a lot simpler than you think. It's like the ideas of like go map out your transformation. So this is where my student is. This is where they want to be, and these are the five steps in between that are going to get them there then map out, okay, how am I going to teach each of these steps? So maybe it's video, maybe it's this kind of video, maybe it's talking head video with a slide presentation, maybe it's audio, whatever your presentation style is, that's fine. So now you have your five save videos. Then in between each video, what are you going to do to reinforce that learning? So I would have a video and then immediately after my video lesson, I would have like a survey, a quiz, a check, a stop, something uh, to do it. And you, when you're using a platform like Thinkific, thinking of this very clear, like very tactically through the platform lens, mm -hmm. like you can do this so simply. Like once you get in there, you'll see it's like drag and drop. Like you drag in your video and then you drag in a quiz and you choose what your questions are going to be. And then that's how you're reinforcing the learning. Then I think the other piece is 
what I've seen really working nicely is in your video telling them to go do that thing. So I'm not just like, and that's that. And then they go to the next lesson. It's like, here's a quiz. And they're like, what is this? I wasn't, I wasn't clear. So like use your video to like clear almost everything and what the next step is in the journey so that it's very uh, cohesive for your students. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> it does. It does. It, it, it's, I think it's a great answer. I think I love the idea of being cohesive, right? Like I, you don't just make a video and then separate, make it separate from the other content. Your content should flow one to another and uh, you should be priming. I mean, if we're going to get instructionally sound here, we're going to prime them for the action that we want them to take, which makes a lot of sense. Exactly. We do have a question. Uh, and Ali asks, I have a lot of users that are not super tech savvy and not super interested in courses about our product. Any tips for engaging with folks who are more eager to figure things out on their own? So it sounds like we've got content that's probably valuable. People who could use that content, but they're not super interested in looking, how do we help them to come to these, these things so that they are gonna get the value of those courses that are being created? I would say think about like how you can create micro learnings and how you can break it down. So if they're not that engaged and like you're having a hard time getting them to commit to go take like a three hour course, it's probably not like you can keep pushing it all you want. It's probably not going to happen. So you can think about either your format or your length or how to kind of get them and bought into the idea of learning from you. So one way that you could do this off the top of my head, you could create like micro learning videos. So maybe it's like a three video series where they're learning just like one little thing in each video. So maybe it's like, I don't know if I was going to teach Thinkific, I would literally teach like how to upload your first video into Thinkific, how to build your first quiz in Thinkific and how to um, I don't know what content to put in your welcome video or something like really simple, small things that I can accomplish in a five minute or less video. And then they can go do like that day. So it's not like this like big conceptual idea that they're like, nah, I don't care. It's too much. I don't know. Like it's like one little thing that they can go do like, oh yeah, watch this video. Oh yeah, look, I did it. That's a win. And so by you creating those like small, quick wins that could almost act as like a funnel, even if it's not a paid program, even if it's pushy just into like your bigger customer education site, but they're like getting the value. They're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. I got it. And then it's like, oh, okay. Now I can learn more. Now I'm ready. I'm in the right mindset. I've been primed <laughs> to learn from this company as a thought leader or as an educator in this space. Yeah. And I, I want to go back to something you said earlier. And I think that relates to this question is, you know, is the going back to knowing your audience, right. And understanding, I would say probably understanding maybe even better. What are the problems that not that you perceive that they have about your program or your, your product, but what are the real problems they're having and start answering those? Because I, my guess is, is that if you're answering those, then they're going to start seeing like, Oh, well now I also want, now that that question is answered, I can go and learn more easily about doing these other things through, you know, what it is that you want them to do. And, you know, I think software is a great example. Any so you could pick any software, right? Like if Adobe wants me to use Photoshop, well, what are the problems I actually have with Photoshop? Because then once I solve some of those early ones, then I can start saying, well, well, what do other people do with Photoshop? What else could I, how else could I use this product to better my life? So I, I do think what you said earlier about understand the audience, understand the problems comes right back into play here. Mm -hmm. Yep. A hundred percent. Thank you for driving that learning home. <laughs> it's nice to hear somebody else talk about it for once instead of just me. <laughs> I, I think um, we're on the same page here, Emily. A hundred percent. And I think like what I loved about what you said is like people sometimes don't know what they need, right? So you have to give them what they want first and then like kind of guide them towards what they need because like a lot of the times you can be looking at somebody so maybe it's the users that i think it was ali just explained you know like okay what they need is this but they don't recognize that need so by creating that kind of content they're not even going to watch it it's not going to resonate it's not going to happen so by finding out what they really want and what they perceive their problems to be it's a great place to start yeah. So, uh, we do have a couple other questions. Uh, some of them are really not part of our conversation. So I'm going to try and answer those after Emily here. We, we let Emily go, but, um, what I do want to get to Emily is that 
you have a great offer. We've talked a lot about Thinkific, which we're, we're glad that we get to, to help out you guys out and have your great information shared with us. And uh, first of all, for anyone that's watching this, if you're looking for a great opportunity upcoming and you, you want to hear from me a little bit more, uh, I'm going to lean back so you can see. I put it as a hashtag here. Uh, it's Amplify is coming up. So Thinkific Amplify is going to be available in January, if I'm right. So yep. you guys can go, go check that out. But tell us a little bit about the offer here. Uh, from Thinkific that we can let everybody know about today. Oops, there we yeah, go. Yeah, absolutely. So we've set it up so that you can go try 30 days free of our most popular plan, so our Pro Plus Growth Plan, um, which is going to give you really like everything you needed more. So you can build amazing learning experiences, amazing courses, sales pages, anything you need to kind of get your course off the ground. Um, you can go check it out. I think it's at THNK. Oh yeah. THNK.cc forward slash TechSmith. So you can go redeem that offer there. It's totally free for 30 days. There's no tricks or contracts or anything like that. Um, once you claim it, you can upgrade or downgrade at any time. Um, if there's anybody watching that is interested in Thinkific Plus, you can definitely send us an email as well. Uh, that's for more of our larger companies and corporations. So you can get started with this trial. And if you want more information, send us an email, hello at thinkific.com, and we can explore kind of what plan makes the most sense for you as an organization. But this is an amazing starting point. We see most of our customers kind of getting started with this plan, which is why we set you up for 30 days free. You can check out the platform. You can also check out those courses that we were talking talking about. So the fast track or the online education business masterclass, once you redeem this, you're going to have access to a ton of resources. So um, some good weekend reading, I guess, if, if you're looking to get your online course business off the ground. And then Matt, yeah, you mentioned Amplify. That is an incredible event. Like I've been doing the interviews for Amplify over the past couple of weeks and I'm floored by the people we have coming on board. So really, really excited to bring that to everybody and uh, yeah, hopefully share some incredible learnings. Yeah. Well, Emily, thank you so much for sharing everything that you did today. So many great nuggets of information. Just, you know, I, I, it's like you said, it's nice to hear someone else saying the things that I've been saying. Uh, so maybe that's just confirmation bias that I've got going on, but, uh, we really do appreciate you taking time out of your, your schedule to spend some time with us and our audience and, and providing such just, I think really good and practical advice because anyone out there. We, I really believe that everyone's got something to say. Everyone's got something to teach, particularly if you're working in a, a, an organization, which a lot of a, the TechSmith customers do. You know, These are ways to look outside of ourselves and what you're doing and find maybe better ways to connect with your audience. So Emily, thank you so much for joining me today on the Visual Lounge. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. All right, we're going to let Emily go there. But a couple of questions I just want to uh, get to before we get into what's new at TechSmith. Paul says, can you recommend a solution for removing keyboard noise during a tutorial video? Paul, this is a tough one. It's a great question and everyone needs to think about it. But a couple of things. First of all, try to move the microphone away from the keyboard, whether that's lifting it up, getting it off your desk so it's not also getting the reverberation from hitting the keys. Um, I know I've got some of that just because I've got a microphone coming down, so it's probably going to pick that up. Um, tr just try to type softer or find a keyboard. You might have to change out a keyboard. Uh, the other thing you can do that I, I think, depending on what type of video you're making, is record separately. Record your audio separately from the action on your screen. It takes a little bit more work, but it works really well if you got a script or something else because then that way you don't have to type at all during your whatever you're doing. Now, sometimes it can't be avoided, so just try to minimize it. Or you can do the thing, if you're going to edit your video, you can type, stop talking, and then you can, uh, you know, type again, you know, so type, stop, you know, don't talk during the typing. Stop typing, talk, or however you're going to want to do it. I think I got that right for you. So hopefully that helps. Um, Grant, I just want to acknowledge I saw your comment. Thank you so much. Uh, and just for those that didn't see it, he said, Matt, this is why these have been great. We have learned so much from you as you started this and improved yourself. I hope so. I hope everyone watching is getting value out of the, the, the podcast as well as the live stream that we're doing because we really want from a, from TechSmith to you, we want you to all be better at making videos, using images, understanding these things, because we think, I mean, yes, we have products. We have great products that we'd love you to buy, but at the end of the day, we also really just feel that these are valuable ideas that anyone can be making video and using images to communicate better. And we even have research 
that says that if you use these things, it helps everyday communication. You can save you and your coworkers time, which is which is always welcome. So now that we've said all that, uh, let's jump right quick into what's new at TechSmith. All right, well, last week we took a little break from what's new at TechSmith because we had a holiday kind of special edition. We were talking about different things and we ran out of time. Thank you to everyone again who came on to that and was there. If you missed it, you can listen to the podcast or you can catch it on the replay, either on the blog or on YouTube. So what do we got going on today? Well, let's share my screen and we'll show you what's going on. We got lots of stuff on the blog that is well worth uh, mentioning that you might've missed. If you missed this one, this, this one was fantastic. Shannon Tipton came on. She did a, such a good job just explaining how you can go from instructor-led courses to virtual-led training, which I think is actually a good, uh, if you watch today, go watch that one because it's going to talk about if you've got like PowerPoint presentations or things you've been doing face-to-face. -face. She walks and gives them, us through and gives some good advice about turning those into uh, virtual. And that could be video. That could be other types of virtual as well. Of course, if you're making videos for YouTube, which I know some of you are, we've got five steps to make a YouTube outro. And if you don't know why you would want a YouTube outro, it's because there's things that you can do there that are going to help build your audience, get them to the next thing, make sure that they're they're understanding what it is that next action. I think that's important. A lot of lessons is what's next. I did this. Now what? Do I go and write and learn, you know, recap what I've learned? Do I need to take go to another video, do you need to take a quiz, whatever it might be. And we heard that advice today from Emily. And then we didn't do this one as a live stream because of the, the Thanksgiving, U.S. Thanksgiving holiday, but how educators can avoid panic and find success teaching online with Janet Lee. If you're an educator uh, and you are trying to find success, you know, probably we're in panic mode much of this year trying to figure everything out. Uh, Janet did such a great job just talking about some of those things. She even gave us some worksheets uh, and some things to help us, some templates that will allow you to really figure out what to do to make your online courses just a little bit better. And, and that's a, she's a lot of talking to K-12 and higher education, but I think it applies to anyone that is doing education. So just another option for you. And then, of course, we've got a whole back catalog of things that if you need to learn about video creation or image making, our blog probably has it covered. So go ahead and check all those things out. You can go to techsmith.com slash blog. Um, you know, with that said, uh, we are going to be taking a break for the next couple of weeks. It's the, the Christmas holidays here in the U.S. And we're going to kind of think about what we're doing. We're going to spend time with our families. We're going to uh, merry make and uh, make some revelry going on. It's going to be a good time. But we're not going to be doing uh, the podcast here. We're going to, what we are going to do is maybe next week, if I hear from enough people, I might just come on live and just shoot the breeze with you guys and answer questions. And we can talk about almost anything, just uh, spend a little bit of time with you, but that will not be part of the podcast. So if you're interested in that, let me know. You can always reach out to me. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I think I've given away my email address many times. So just feel free to contact me if you're like, yes, I would love to spend some time asking questions. Who knows? Maybe we'll bring on a guest or two. We'll, we'll see who's in, in the office working remotely uh, during next week. But we'll, we'll try to do something for you guys. So with that said, we hope that you, you're enjoying what you're learning. We really do hope you get a lot of value out of this, uh, everything that we're doing here. And if you know, you spend a little time making video, we hope that you just take a little bit of time in that process to level up every single day. Thanks everybody. And we'll see you guys officially in the new year.